Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Rodwin, and tonight I'd like to talk to you about Jewish American composers. We're going to be covering about 10 decades and 10 minutes, so fasten your seatbelts. And also make sure to read some of the stuff that's up there, because I have so little time, I've included more information up there than I can even talk about. Now, to begin to understand Jewish American composers, we have to look at European Jewish composers. Basically, before the 20th century, their plight was this. They had to convert to Christianity if they wanted their music to be played. That included great composers like Mendelssohn and Offenbach, uh, Meyerbeer, Mahler, and even Schoenberg. Uh, however, the game changed in 1868 because the composer Wagner, who was also one of the most respected philosophers of his time, put out a treatise about Jews and music, and this is what he said. The Jew speaks the language of the nation in whose midst he dwells, but he speaks it always as an alien. Song is just talk aroused to highest passion, music is the speech of passion, and that makes the Jew almost incapable of giving artistic enunciation to his feelings. So having no musical language of his own, the Jew musician hurls together the diverse forms and styles of every age and every master. Packed side by side, we find the formal idiosyncrasies of all the schools in motliest chaos. Now, this is a vile anti-Semitic screed, but I took a look at it again about a month ago, and I found something interesting. I, I don't agree with Wagner in most of what he says, but when he says the word motliest chaos, I found that really intriguing. And I think what he actually is talking about is an aesthetic of eclecticism. And I'm wondering if there's a grain of truth in what he says in terms of identifying what the unifying aesthetic between Jewish American composers are. Now, to really understand this, we have to start with Arnold Schoenberg, who was born in Vienna, but later emigrated to America. Schoenberg's earlier work, like Verklärte Nacht in 1899, sounded almost exactly as though Wagner had composed it himself. Over the next decade, though, he took Wagner's harmonic language and he increased it and he codified it and he made it something even, more, in his mind, more and better. Um, and he called this the 12-tone system. So you have some idea what it sounds like. Here's one of the landmark pieces from 1912 that he composed. Das Wort nichts Gleiche bietet, die Wunsen wunderlos. Now, the first thing you'll notice in this vocal line is that it doesn't seem to be like a normal phrase of music that has a beginning and middle and end and you can track where it's going. You often feel like a phrase of music has a real trajectory. Now, there's a reason for this. The atonal music that Schoenberg was composing, he wanted to have no tonal center. And because of that, it's very, uh, it's hard to hear at first. And at the time, was considered extremely radical. But within 10 years, it was adopted as the mainstream way of composing in Germany. Luckily, Aaron Copland, who was born in the United States in 1900, didn't go to Germany when he studied music. Instead, he went to France. There were almost no music institutions of any merit in America at the time. So he studied with a woman named Nadia Boulanger. And when she looked at his early scores, the first thing she said was, these are terrible. It's not that you don't have talent, it's that you're trying to compose like a European. Now just stop it, go home and write something American. And this is what he did. Listen really closely, because it starts quiet. And the first thing you notice is that the music is remarkably simple. It has none of the harmonic complexities that they were using in Europe at the time. And if you listen a little bit more, at the same time, it's not French because Copland has stripped all of the French embellishment, all of the cassandos, all of the tricks that make French music sound French, he's stripped them away and made it very plain spoken. And once he's done Americanizing the French, he turns to the Germans, Wagner's music, and brings it to America. He's stripped it of the harmonic complexity that Schoenberg and even Wagner before was playing with. And he's made it this stark landscape. It's like the Great Plains are in front of us. It's like he has the Rocky Mountains ahead of him, and he's trying to create a language that is totally American. But what's interesting about that is that he is still buying into this idea that music is somehow nationally based. And also, if you listen to that, ask yourself, does it sound in any way Jewish? In many ways, Copland didn't engage with his Jewish identity in his music. 
However, his protege, Leonard Bernstein, did. He was one of the great integrators. He had a very religious upbringing and actually learned how to speak Hebrew in the 1920s in America, which was just unheard of at the time. And he incorporated that into his work very early on. His first symphony he wrote when he was 25 shocked the world because for the first time in concert halls anywhere in America or in Europe, he had a text that was set to Hebrew. So he's using a liturgical text straight from the Bible, from the book of Jeremiah. But at the same time, the other compositions he have, they deal directly with popular music. The section from the Dance of the Gym from West Side Story is pure Cuban music. And he took this because he went vacationing back in the 40s down in the Keys in Florida, and he was actually able to tune in his radio to Radio Havana in Cuba. It took him 15 years to figure out how to integrate that into his music, but he did. And Bernstein was an extraordinary omnivore when it came to music. As a conductor, he actually also conducted pieces that he didn't even like because he thought they were still important. And he did that starting in 1957 when he became the music director of the New York Philharmonic with composers he couldn't sort of stand like this one, a contemporary of his, Milton Babbitt. Now, Milton Babbitt is the most influential composer you've never heard of. Most people have never actually heard his music. And part of the reason for that is that he spent his time in the universities. For 60 years, he was the head of the composition departments at Princeton, Columbia, and Juilliard. He single-handedly taught more composition teachers and professors than anyone else in this country. And his music was based on Schoenberg's music, but for him, the 12-tone music was not complex enough. So he used mathematic algorithms to actually begin to govern both, uh, not just pitch, but also rhythm in a form of composition he called serialism. And this is what it sounded like. Now, when you start listening to Babbitt, it sounds like random notes just thrown out onto speakers. But I can assure you, if you look at the formulas that he used to actually put this together, it would boggle most physicists when they looked at it. However, most people didn't want to listen to it, and that includes even the people who studied under him, like Philip Glass. Philip Glass, if you look at his earliest pieces, actually sound a lot like Babbitt's. They're serialist and 12-tone pieces. But like Bernstein, he had his ear to the popular music of the day. So he found a way to incorporate his rock and roll into his classical compositions. Let's listen to a section from Einstein on the Beach, his seminal 1976 opera that lasted five hours long. The first thing you notice is there's one chord. One chord. This is like telling your teacher, F you. And then as it begins to develop, you still hear it's one chord. Uh, Philip Glass popularized minimalism. He didn't create it, but he popularized it. And he plays with texture and color and rhythm, but not harmonics. The other thing you'll begin to find is that Glass is a universalist. So he is looking for things that will communicate to everyone. Sometimes that just means counting numbers. Listen to this next section from Einstein. In some ways it doesn't mean anything, but in another way he thought that could reach all of humanity. In some ways Glass never has embraced anything Jewish directly in his work. He's composed pieces in Sanskrit, Navajo, and French, but never in Hebrew. And yet, listen to this violin line for a second. We have an African-American text with an African-American speaker. But there's something about that violin line that to me somehow sounds distinctly Jewish. Despite the fact that overtly in his work, he never actually approaches anything Jewish. At the same time, he has a contemporary, Steve Reich, who actually is the father of minimalism, along with Terry Riley, who embraced his uh, Judaism directly. He actually, like Bernstein, also included work that was in Hebrew, like this. If you begin to listen, you hear around a chorus, like row, row, row your boat, except with meters and rhythms that are extremely complex and very difficult to perform. And 
that finally brings us to my generation. And the first amazing thing about my generation is finally we have women on the scene taking center stage. I'm going to talk about Carla Kilstedt for a second. She is a friend of mine, and she is a performer as well as a composer, which you sort of have to be these days, because arts funding has dwindled so much. Orchestras are not commissioning new music from living composers, and you have to actually hire your own bands to hear your music played. So uh, Carla has a number of bands, and she pulls both from her classical violin training as well as from her punk rock roots, and she creates music like this. Her work is performed in clubs, almost never in concert halls. But she never would have composed that if she didn't have her classical training. So what can we see from 100 years of Jewish American composers? Is there anything that actually shows any kind of consistency? I think in the sounds, you don't hear any great consistency. But in their process, and like Wagner said, they take from all times, all periods, all places, all ethnicities. They grab whatever they want into this grand, eclectic aesthetic. And I think in doing so, they create something really wonderful. And that is their great contribution over the last 100 years. Thank you.